Hi, and welcome to Reading the Woods. Uh, my name is Nancy Patch. I'm the Franklin Grand Isle County Forester. Uh, the County Forester Program is here to assist any landowners in the state of Vermont at, uh, with questions on their forests, questions on their trees. So anytime you need assistance or have questions for uh, the County Foresters, please feel free to just give us a call. We're, we're there to help. Uh, I'm going to start this presentation about reading the woods. Uh, the presentation really is about getting to know what Vermont forests are like and how you can tell how the history has affected the forest in your own backyard. Vermont has a very rich land use history. If we can remember what uh, I've, that our forests have changed dramatically since the colonization, European colonization of the United States. Pre, the pre-settlement forest in Vermont looked very, very different than it does today. Uh, our forest cover was 90 to 95 percent of the state, and it was really a different species mix than it is today. It was dominated more by hemlock and beech, with some spruce and maple mixed in, and this is really because uh, beech and hemlock are very shade tolerant, meaning that they can grow and thrive in the understory of uh, a dense canopy cover. Where maple, while tolerant to some shade, is not extremely tolerant. So as the forest uh, grew and developed, the the larger part of the com composition were these shade tolerant species and disturbances that would occur on the forest would allow the, the wide diversity and mix of all of the species that we have currently in Vermont at somewhat different compositional levels. Uh, it also was a place where there was a vast diversity of wildlife. Um, some of those species which have been extirpated now um, were here present, such as the wolf and the mountain lion, but we retain the vast majority of our species today that existed pre-colonial, which is really ex exciting for all of us in Vermont in the Northern Forest. We actually have the most intact broadleaf temperate forest in the entire world. So that is something special that we need to recognize and protect in, this, in the state of Vermont and the Northern Forest. Uh, so other species that may have been uh, that are extinct, and actually the only one that we think might be extinct at this point, although we haven't documented all species, um, is the passenger pigeon. Uh, we we lost that species. Uh, we don't want to lose more. Uh, what I also want to say that uh, this forest was also managed. We didn't. We weren't the first. The European colonialists were not the first ones to manage this forest. There was a a very rich and and diverse native population here that was working to manage the forest for wildlife habitat and um, game management for themselves. So this was a used forest many, many years ago for, for thousands of years. But in the uh, early 1700s, we started settling in from European colonials started coming in. And uh, in the mid 1700s, before we, we became the United States, uh, we did have a population in Vermont, but it was a small population, people that were really starting to clear the forest. And as you look at the forested landscape now, you see what people have done, the stone walls, the rock piles, the amount of work is almost incomprehensible that people were cutting all of these forests and the trees down with crosscut saws. So there's a, a lot of manpower, but there was just the beginning in the middle of the 1700s. But then later on, by the by 1800 and at about the time of the Civil War, 1850, 
We had cleared almost all of the state of Vermont. We had at that point in time only about 20% of forest cover. And that forest cover was really concentrated in the very high mountain tops, the swamps, and probably each individual farm having their own sugar bush so that they could produce their own sugar. So this is, this was a very, very different uh, landscape. And some of the things that we don't know about is what we've done to the biodiversity of the soil by changing that soil composition and clearing it, turning it over, plowing it, and dramatically altering it probably forever. So there are things that we have changed that could never be replaced. We cannot go back to the, the time of pre-colonization of 300 years ago. But it's really significant to see our, our landscape, knowing if you did it, if you stood and turned around and looked all around the landscape that you could, re, could realize that it probably had no trees. So look at us now. We have a population that is pretty high for a small state, 650,000 people, and our forests are back. We now have 78% of our landscape that is covered in forest. While this forest is quite different than the pre-colonial forest, our trees are more dominated by sugar maple, beech, and birch across our northern, our northern part of the landscape in the northern forest. And Another interesting thing is to say that we are, for the first time, starting to lose that forest cover again due to development. So since we've been recovering from our early clear cutting of our forest, we have been expanding the forest cover up until this last decade, where we're starting once again to lose forest cover. I'd like to show you this interesting schematic. It just sort of shows that history of wildlife habitat and how things changed. If you look to the um, pre-settlement condition where I previously explained we have 90% forest cover, uh, we then started to drop that forest cover and we were also eliminating some of the predators that uh, those colonials were concerned about, such as the wolf, the lynx the mountain lion. Those were starting to be um, removed from the landscape by hunting and trapping, but also because we had uh, eliminated the, uh, the ecosystem that they, their habitat that they require. Um, that, during that time of land abandonment and reestablishment of the forest, our deer populations started to expand. We went from almost a, a complete extirpation of, of white-tailed deer to a deer population by the 1950s that is the highest point ever because we had a very young forest. We had, our forest had recovered in waves. So the first wave was the abandonment of farms because of the Civil War, the loss of human life, the movement of people to the Midwest. Our, we also had another um, abandonment of farms when the tractor came in and the horses were no longer used. It was, diff it was difficult to use that landscape. Another abandonment came in when uh, we went to bulk tanks for for milking, which required subsist or created that subsistence farming to sort of go away. And by the 1950s, this is where we were. We had a young, young forest with lots of food for, for deer. The coyotes started moving back in around that time as well. We reintroduced the fisher into Vermont, which is thriving and healthy population now, which did affect some of the deer population and our forests got mature again. So we are now at that 85% forested condition. We know our forests are moving from that young, young stage into an older forest condition. And so um, this is just an example of how things change.
Now I want you to look at how well, have a look at the woods. There are things, two things that you really want to think about, and if there's nothing else that you look at when you look at the woods, and that's species composition and forest structure. A wonderful resource to get a hold of is Wetland, Woodland, and Wildland. It's the Guide to the Natural Communities of Vermont by Elizabeth Thompson and Eric Sorensen. This has become my Bible and is the Bible of many of of people working in the natural resource world. And this is a great book for any landowner to have. Okay, so now I'm going to be talking just a little bit about the natural communities, uh, the forest and natural communities in Vermont. Um, and in specifically in this slide, I'm going to just, I'm just showing a few of the kind of unusual and rare natural communities that we have identified in the state that we we know needs protection and sometimes these uh these natural communities are common across the state but maybe very uncommon in a particular location so even those we need to think about as protecting some of the places that we're very interested in making sure stay on the landscape that have been dramatically altered are things like limestone bluff, cedar pine forest. Those forests are really only found on high calcareous uh, rock types and much along the edge of Lake Champlain. So we are now looking at ways to protect the remaining uh, forests of these conditions. Dry oak woodland at the, and, and very rare examples of this forest. Uh, and additionally, we have our riparian forests, like, like the silver maple ostrich fern forests. Uh, those need to be protected, not altered, and in many times, in many cases, restored. How you look at your forest, you need to look at soil and water because they are the dramatic driving forces of our landscape. So our soil conditions drive the type of forest, the type of trees, the species composition that you're going to find on a forest is defined by the soil type. So take a look at your soils and if you know, start learning with your soils, are they wet soils or dry soils or rich soils, then you can know what kind of forest wants to be there, even if that forest isn't. For example, there's a, there are vernal pools and our riparian zones, streams and rivers and wetlands and beaver impoundments all drive the type of forest that's going to be there. Forests and wetlands are just wonderful, interesting places to be. They uh, are unique on our landscape, often the place where our water resources are beginning, so they're the, the source of our clean water. Uh, forested wetlands, sometimes people don't even recognize them because there's trees growing all through them. And so if there's trees there, people don't say, oh, this is a wetland. Uh, but in, in fact, many of our, our forests include forested wetlands throughout them, things like seeps and red maple swamps. We have to be very careful when we're managing our forests to recognize these places because they need to be treated differently. We do not want to alter the hydrology or change the flow of the water. These, these are places where the rare plants and animals are found that are found nowhere else. So let's protect those places. Vernal pools are such interesting places. Um, there are animals that have been considered obligate animals, such as the spotted salamander. It's true that spotted salamanders can indeed thrive and mate and breed in larger permanent ponds, but in a vernal pool, the cool thing about that those kinds of ecosystems are there are no predators of things like spotted salamanders, wood frogs, because there's no place for fish to come in or out of, and they dry up once at least every two years so that green frogs and bullfrogs cannot go through their whole metamorphosis. So those are, no, are not allowed to be in there as predators either. So identifying these pools are sometimes hard because they do dry up, 
but knowing where they are, protecting the buffers of them and protecting the life zone for these pools is critically important. Riparian areas are important for our water quality, they're important for wildlife corridors, to places where animals can move through the landscape to get from one place to another. One of the most critical things that we need to think about in Vermont is to protect our large forest blocks and to, and to protect those connecting places, places in between. Many of your forests, many of the small backyard woodlots are indeed those connecting landscapes. So these are the places that we must protect in order to protect the integrity of the whole. Now our riparian areas, examples of those are many, but some of the natural communities are silver maple ostrich fern, silver maple sensitive fern. We have others, but those are the, look for those species and find out what grows in your riparian areas. Our forests, again, are changing. They have different stages of growth. And if you think of people often think of old forests as being uh, just one kind of age class and it's uh, big giant trees. Well, that's actually not true. There's all sorts of disturbance that happens in our forest. So even in an old forest, we have young forest. So the, a pioneer forest is a, is a forest that is taking over a landscape that has been either altered either by harvesting or disturbance such as fire or wind. Um, they tend to be even aged. Perfect example of a pioneer forest is aspen, which is a short-lived tree that must have direct full sunlight in order to uh, regenerate and grow. They take over, they grow, they change the soil chemistry, they provide shade, they provide nutrients that and allow other trees that need a little bit of shade to grow into them. So these aspen trees are a perfect example of what we might call a nurse tree, a tree that actually can help the next stage of growth. As I said, they're immature for, or biologically immature for us, they're stand replacing, they often are simple in structure. An old forest, on the other hand, is a biologically mature forest, which has a lot of diversity in, in it. We really think of them as not being stand replacing or having any major disturbance for more than 100 years, including human caused disturbance. So we have very, very, very few old forests in Vermont. Um, some people used to call them old growth forests or um, late successional forests. We have late successional forests, but a true old forest needs to have about 150 years old trees that are, are a significant part of their forest and have many, many age classes, gaps, regeneration, dead trees, dead woody material on the ground, snag trees, all sorts of diversity. An old forest is a diverse forest. This is a quick slide I'll go through that just kind of depicts what an even age versus an uneven age forest is. So when I talked about that pioneer forest, they're typically even aged forests. They have all, they're all growing at the same time. An uneven age forest is one that's kind of grown through a more complex time period where there's been disturbance, which allows for regeneration to be in the understory and a multiple age different kinds of trees. The, uh, different species composition is often found in, in these unaged forests as well. So this is a, just a schematic. But this is a couple of pictures of, of what that schematic might look like. So looking at the, the top left-hand corner where you've got vertical structure. You're looking at regeneration in one pocket, and this is actually created by the one, the picture below it where there's a canopy gap. If there's a gap in the, in the canopy, a gap in the overstory, you're allowing sunlight to hit the forest floor, encouraging regeneration. On the right-hand side of the, of the uh, slide is a multiple age class where you can see all sorts of different sized trees and a lot of complexity, including the coarse woody material and snags that you see at the, at the bottom.
We also want to look at all the things that we can tell that we've been here. It doesn't take long to say that there's been someone in this forest before, and there's all sorts of ways to see it. You know, stone walls and cellar holes are found throughout our forest. We want to keep these too. This is evidence. This is archaeological evidence of our past. <clears throat> and we would like to make sure that we hold on to these, these areas and know what our history was. Sugaring arches, stone piles. If you see a stone pile in the forest, that was a pasture. There's no doubt about it. People did not pile stones where there were trees that were being retained. This had been cleared and used as pasture. Our cedar fencing, particularly in the, in the Champlain Islands, those, those fences are often older than the stone walls that we see. Um, we also can find remnant use of, of the forest through bridges, rail bridges, and road bridges that were that are still intact. Our our predecessors were wonderful engineers. So look at your woods. See what's there. See what came before you. There's ghosts and history and and stories that can be told in your own backyard. What kind of disturbance do we talk about sometimes? Well, we have both kinds of disturbance. We have natural disturbance and human disturbance. And a natural disturbance is what takes place in our forests without any of our interaction, which includes fire, wind, insects and disease, ice and snow. Uh, the human disturbance is farming, sugaring, and logging as examples. And I'll run through some of those. You can see sometimes a lightning strike. So look for your trees. You can see that a long, sometimes a long gap will show a lightning strike or fire in the landscape. You can see charred examples of pitch pine, which is a fire related tree. And even looking at the trees been cut down, what's gone on in that, in that tree's life? You can even see where there might have been a couple of fires just because of the charred bark evidence within the tree ring. Looking at wind, we've had some big winds in Vermont occasionally. Um, hurricane, the 1938 hurricane is an example. But more recently, we've had lots of smaller downbursts, and that is more typical of our landscape. Our landscape in, in Vermont in the northern forest is dominated by small wind disturbances. And so when you can see recent disturbances, you can, you can look at what might have taken place a 100 years before. And and take a look at what that 100 years before might show up. It's the pit and mound. And looking at the pit and mound is a perfect example of knowing that a forest has been a forest for a really long time. It's where a tree has blown over, the root ball becomes the mound, and where it pulled up the ground is the pit. If you find pit and mounds in your forest, that forest had not been cleared for pasture. It has always been forest. We also have evidence of insect and disease issues. Um, taking a look at a forest tent caterpillar outbreak, you can see waves of trees that have been significantly defoliated, often uh, mortality uh, in developing, which creates the the, the new uh, habitat requirements for establishing the forest once again to, to allow for regeneration to take place. So if we manage our forests appropriately, we will manage them so that we have the regeneration there before we take the overstory off. And this is what nature does on its own. We need to mimic nature when we manage our forests. Snow and ice more common. Climate change is creating these kinds of, of uh, disturbances at a more frequent and more intense rate. So managing our forests is important to create a good healthy crown with a corresponding healthy root system to hold up to the snow and ice and windstorms that are becoming more and more frequent on our landscape. Now looking at some of the things that we did um, as human disturbance, look at open land. This is a former pasture. 
we we also want to keep some of these places on our landscape as well. This former pasture may still be pastured, but it's not intensively used. You can see lots of different kinds of uh, species throughout. This is a this could be a wonderful pollinator field, wonderful for bees and butterflies and insects and and also grassland birds. Now we can look at this as the forest has recovered. If you look in the middle of this landscape, you're seeing a lot of pine. And, and that pine is the response of being what was once a, a field. So there's a mix of pine and hemlock, and you can see above it, there's a, a, another part of the forest that is very much aspen. And then we can come into some older hardwood. So you're looking at a, at a picture of a forest that is going through many stages of forest succession. The more you can understand how forest succession works, the more you can understand what the history of that landscape is. Another thing that we do with our landscape is we tap our trees, we sugar them. And this is an example of two different kinds of sugar bushes. One that is an older forest that is even aged, and then one that has some remnant old sugar maples that may no longer be tapped, but they were scattered across the landscape, probably a, a sugar bush that was grazed by cattle, that cattle had been placed in this forest. And once the cattle were removed, then the younger trees started growing up. And this is an example of a two-stage, a two-aged forest. We also are harvesting our forest. Uh, if we, with sustainable harvesting, we can maintain our forest integrity, make sure that our forests have value, stay forest, keeping our forest forest. Uh, but you can also see when a forest has been harvested. Take a look at the stumps, the stumps that show a, a uh, straight cut. You're going to know that it was done with a chainsaw or a crosscut saw. Many, well, crosscut saws probably not, but you'll see that it was a chainsaw cut and in more recent history. But that stump that we're looking at on the left-hand side is, is a quite an old stump. It's probably 40, 30 or 40 years old. And on the right-hand side of this slide, you can see that a tree that started growing over an old stump. So there, this tree that looks quite old has been growing over the remnants of a, a stump from a previous cut. This is what it looks like when you do it well. This is an ecologically managed forest. This is what we want our forests to look like when they're managed for our use. So come to the end of my, my talk, uh, just my, from my hero, Aldo Leopold, uh, who had it right. An action is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of a living community, and wrong when it tends to do otherwise. Thank you for listening. If you want to learn a little bit more about reading the forested landscape, one of the most wonderful books out there is by Tom Wessels. Uh, please take a look at that, and thank you once again.